fellowship with the saints. Uh, sometimes I've been around the grace movement and, and around right division dispensationalism, and I don't really listen to a lot of um, uh, the evangelists or uh, religious church operators on, on TV and the radio today. I just don't. Uh, so I, I forget about the fact that everybody doesn't believe that there's no tongue talking today in the dispensation of grace. But anyway, I don't know who's here. So we're going to study the Word of God and see whether these things be so. First Corinthians chapter 13. I want to say my dear wife's over there, my helpmate. Uh, she made sure I was dressed appropriately today, and so I appreciate it for that. And um, we just thank God for the privilege of being with saints of like-minded faith. First Corinthians 13, verse 8. Charity never faileth, but whether it be tongue, prophecies, they shall fail. Whether it be tongues, they shall cease. Whether it be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, that which is part shall be done away. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But most of all, we thank you for our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. And we just pray that as we study these things, that they might become as clear to us as they are to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, you know, the t- subject of songs, tongues is a doctrine on the dispensational issue. It's everything is today. And water baptism obviously went along with that as well as the other things we discussed. Now, can you hear me, number one? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 13, chapter 12, 13, and 14 is one unit. But I want to say some things about the Corinthians saints that Paul said to us. That number one in 1 Corinthians 1, he said they came behind in no gift. So during the time of the Acts period, all the Gentile churches had all the sign gifts. That's what they're calling in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. They're called spiritual gifts. But he also said that they were carnal. He said they were carnal and they walked as men. So you got a bunch of carnal believers that get all the spiritual gifts. So that tells me something. That it wasn't something they had to do for those gifts. It's something that God the Holy Spirit distributed to them as he saw fit. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14 is one unit talking about these spiritual gifts. And mine is about the issue of tongues. But I want to make it clear that the tongues are part of the sign gifts. And there's a reason for that. So I want you to look at some verses with me, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Is that loud? I can hear me. I don't like hearing me. I'm like, boom. Okay. I asked you all, could you hear me? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now watch what he says. Now he's talking about different subjects to the Corinthian saints. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts. Brother, I would not have you be ignorant. And, of course, you've heard over and over again, it's been a group called Ignorant Brethren. But the issue of the Corinthian saints is that they were spiritual babes. They weren't functioning in the identification and understanding of who we are in Christ today. And this subject of tongues and spiritual gifts is an issue, and I'll just say this in the beginning, that all the church, the, the Gentile local assemblies during the Acts period, all had to sign gifts. But Paul is reproving the Corinthian saints about the understanding and misuse of them. The verse we read is clear that Paul understood at this time that the sign gifts were going to cease. So we're going to talk about when was that going to happen. But what I want you to see is in verse number uh, 10 to another, he talks about the different gifts. Look at verse number 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit, and that's God the Holy Spirit, is given to every man to profit with all. For to one of you is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, and he goes through these different spiritual gifts. Uh, verse number 10, to another to work in the miracles, to another the prophecy. And because I know time's going to start moving, I just want to look at the uh, end of the verse there. He says, to another, diverse con- types, uh, diverse kinds of, you see the plural there? It's tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. Then if you look at the end of the chapter, verse number 29, he says, are all apostles, are all prophets? Verse number 30, have all the gifts of healing. And by the way, these are gifts. These are spiritual gifts. He says, verse uh, number 30, do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret it? So what he's going to do is show them a more excellent way. But the issue of tongues in the Bible uh, I love our King James Bible because it sets up its own terms and definitions. So where do tongues appear in the scriptures the first time? Where do you read about tongues? Well, come on, Genesis chapter 11. And, and I'm going to hopefully share some things that maybe you know, maybe you don't know. But there, there's something that's going on. And, and when Paul begins to talk about these, these sign gifts that has to do with God's dealing with the nation of Israel that deals with the mystery program. <laughs> 
So I want to kind of see if I can develop that because, you know, all the scripture is given progressively. And, and by the way, and I haven't, haven't made it clear, Paul's epistles, his early epistles have to be rightly divided among his latter epistles. If you don't understand what he's saying in the beginning, Paul continues to give progressive revelation about the mystery program. That's going to be key. He doesn't know it all in the beginning. And yet, as the scriptures are developed, and let me say this to you too, the Apostle Paul wrote 13 epistles of the 27 books of the New Testament. In the book of Acts, he appears in the book of Acts primarily from 9 to the end. So Paul appears or is spoken about out of the 27 books of the New Testament 14 times. But it's fascinating to me that most people, uh, believers, don't know who the Apostle Paul is. There's something spiritual about that one. If you wrote more than half the books or a part of being a part of the half books of the New Testament, why don't people know who Paul is? Right. So part of what I'm going to talk about is this counterfeit religious system out here. You've heard it over and over again that, that opposes what God is doing today in the church, the body of Christ, and why there's so much confusion. Now, remember he said, I don't want you to be ignorant. Right. So part of not being ignorant is let the word of God be true. Mm-hmm. You never met a liar. Uh, chapter 11, verse number 1. You all know the story. It's the Gentiles and, and the Tower of Babel. Verse number 1. Genesis 11, 1. He says, and the whole earth was a one language, and what else? One speech. So at this time, there was only one language that was spoken universally. Verse number 2. And it came to pass as a journey from the east. And this is Nimrod. They found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said, uh, one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime and half a mortar. And they said, notice what these, these Gentiles are saying, go let us build a city in the tower. Now we know that that's a political city and a religious issue there. It's the Tower of Babylon, of Babel. And whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make a name for ourselves. Uh, let us make a name lest we be scattered upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built it. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. Now, you get all these folks talking the same language. They can communicate how to rebel against God. And they have one language, and there's nothing, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. And then he says, Let us go down. That's the triumph God. Let us go down and there confound their language that they might not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build a city. Therefore, the name of it is called Babel, the colon, because the Lord there did confound the language of all the earth. So at that time, the languages appeared. Now come to Genesis chapter 10, because Genesis 11 it's historically written, and obviously Genesis 10 is after the languages were developed by the nations. I did, I just did some languages called linguistics. Linguistics. Obviously, I'm talking too fast, but there's almost 7,000 languages today on the planet Earth. Did you know that? 7,000, 6,909. So I'm rounding off the numbers. That's a lot of languages. And let me say something before I, I really get into the lesson. I was at a Assemblies of God's uh, church one day. And they brought in a Russian evangelist. Now, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says if somebody speaks in tongues, there should be an interpreter, right? Yeah. Well, that was in a local church. There was somebody, if you spoke in a language, which we're going to see that's what tongues were in the Bible, then somebody would be able to interpret that language. Because what's, what's happening, they're producing the canon of scriptures. They're producing the word of God. And so it wasn't some gibberish. And so the evangelist gets up and he speaks in, in Russian. So this local church, big Assemblies of God church, hired a lost person to come in and interpret. Now I'm sitting there thinking to myself, if you all, are you getting the picture? They believe in speaking in tongues. They bring in a missionary from Russia that they supported. But nobody was in the assembly to interpret what the Russian was saying. So they went and got a lost person who was an interpreter to interpret Russian so the person could speak in English. That's some dumb stuff. It doesn't make sense. You had to pay the person. What amazed me even more is I'm sitting there saying, they don't get it. 
they don't get what they're looking at. But anyway, chapter 10, <laughs> verse number five. By these were the, now this is the sons of uh, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. By these were the islands of the Gentiles divided, notice this, in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, and in their nations. The issue of tongues. The, the language there, their languages are developed when they're separated by God. And they're root languages. Uh, verse number 20. These are the sons of Ham. So in verse number 20, we have the Africans. After their families, after their tongues. You see the tongues there? The languages. In their countries and in their nations. Come to verse number 31. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, and after their nations. Obviously, that happens after chapter 11, because in chapter 11, there's one speech and one language. Now you have all these languages. So in the Bible, the Bible defines that tongues are languages. Now, let me give you another story. My mother, my dear mother, I love her. She's a believer. But my sister goes to some I don't know, he, first he was a brother, then he was a bishop, now he's an apostle. <laughs> you know, they, they, he's, a, he's a religious church operator. And she's, we're teaching in John, chap, well, I'm in John chapter 4 in our Bible classes, and by the way, it says over there, many other signs in the book of John that Jesus do in the midst of the disciple, which is not written in the book of John. But he says, these are written that you may know, those signs, the eight signs in John, that you may know that Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God. The signs were proof of his messiahship and his deity, according to Isaiah chapter 35. So she's sitting at the dinner table and the now apostle who used to be a bishop is trying to make this guy speak in tongues. And he kept saying, well, do it this way and do it this way. And the guy said, well, I can't, apostle. And my mother said, well, why don't you stop? He can't do it. And I, so I'm teaching in class. My mother's there, not the apostle. And I'm going through these sign gifts to show why the sign gifts were there and when they cease. And so I said, look at the verse. And she said, well, maybe he just didn't know how to speak in tongues. I said, well, Ma, look at the verse. It says that they were going to cease. So this guy was one of those religious church operators trying to make somebody do something that God Almighty wasn't doing today. Now, that's the last time I thought about somebody who believes that you can speak in tongues. The, the amazing part, he couldn't do it. Now, there are people maybe looking, and maybe people here that believe that you can do that today. But it wasn't a bunch of gibberish. This guy would have been speaking in languages, had a supernatural gift to do that. So come with me to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. You all know these verses, but I, I got a point in doing this. Because there's going to be something that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 that I want to, I want to bring out. So I, I'm developing this first. So the question would come up. Obviously, the Jews had the gifts that Mark 16 is going to talk about. Verse number, uh, let's start with verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We'll go back to verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye and preach in all the world and preach the gospel. Now, we know as believers who study the Bible dispensation, that's the gospel of the kingdom. He said to every creature, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, he that, but he that believes not shall be down. Now, verse 17, and these signs shall follow them that believe. The first thing he says, in my name they shall cast out devils. The second one, they shall speak with, you see that word, new tongues. This doesn't say tongues, new tongues. Now, come to Acts chapter 2, and you all know that happened. Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost. So, obviously, that's why they call themselves Pentecostals. I don't know if you know this or not. I kind of like to sometimes peruse and find out things, but the Assemblies of God, they had an event back in the early part of the 1900s in San Francisco called Azusa Street. Anybody know about that? Okay, that's where they, they were trying to recover these sign gifts. Now, the record says that they were in some kind of uh, building where there was a bunch of spiritualists there. So they began to speak in tongues, and they believed in the gift of healing. I don't know if you knew this or not, too, but the early people in the Assemblies of God, the older men, were dispensationalists. But they got rid of studying the Bible, writing the Bible, because Mr. Schofield and his Bible had that those gifts were going to cease. 
So he didn't want the people to know that. So they came up with what they call the full gospel. Did you guys know that? So the full gospel is that all the Bible is for you and all the Bible is to you. So you can begin to see how this begins to be developed by a big organization and promoted, right? Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. Verse number, uh, for time's sake, I'll start at verse number 4. Now, this is the day of Pentecost. There, the people who are in the upper room, chapter 1, are there. And it says, let's well, start at verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothed in tongues like as a fire, and sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, comma, and began to do what? Speak with tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Not the apostles sitting there making somebody learn how to do it. They're all filled with the Holy Ghost in light of prophecy of that new covenant coming, and they're able to do something supernatural. Now, you know that because in verse number 5, it says, They were dwelling all in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Uh, verse number 6. Now, when this was noised abroad, the marks who came together and were confounded. Why were they confounded? Because they heard every man... Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Now, that wasn't like the assembly of God that had to bring in the interpreter for the Russian evangelist. These men were speaking languages that they had never learned. Now, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23, when the Lord comes back and those Jews who are redeemed go to all the nations, it's going to, it's, they're going to be able to speak na the languages of other nations with the gospel of the kingdom. Not, not the gospel that we preach today called the gospel of grace. And by the way, like Pastor Jordan says, I speak in English. I have an English Bible. It wouldn't do you any good if I spoke in another language and you couldn't understand me. So God got enough wisdom to know that. Now, in verse number four, it says, When they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance, there's a comparison verse in chapter four that I want to look at. The same phenomenon happens, but the Holy Spirit changes something in the passage. Verse number 31. Now, I'm the kind of preacher. I've learned how to slow down. And when I hear the page is turning, I want you to get to the page before I get there and start telling what it says. So I'm going to slow down, even though you're spending up my time on the clock. Okay? But I'm going to be gracious. I want you to read it for yourself. Verse number 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were, where they were assembled together. Now watch what he says. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Is that what your Bible says? What did it say they did? They spake the word of God with boldness. Now in John chapter 14, the Lord told those disciples that when the Spirit of God would come, he would begin to reveal things to them about prophecy because what Peter's talking about is a prophetic program now Paul's not saved yet so God is still dealing with the nation of Israel but I want you to understand something that Israel is under judgment they're under judicial judgment because they rejected God the father they rejected God the son and we know in Acts 7 through Stephen's they're going to reject God the Holy Spirit so they commit the unpardonable sin so the wrath of God was supposed to come upon the nations because in Genesis 11 God gave it to Gentiles now the Jews are concluded in unbelief, and prophecy said that God Almighty was going to start the, the 70th week of Daniel that was fulfilled. The Lord called it the time of vengeance. So Israel knew that. But in Acts chapter 9, Saul and Tarsus get saved. Now I want you to see something in Acts chapter 10, because this is fascinating to me. How the order begins to change when the program changes. You all know the story of Cornelius. Verse 34, for time's sake. But Cornelius begins to see God, and, and Peter gets a vision. And Peter begins to be taught about the distinctions being done away between Jew and Gentile. He's getting ready to meet Paul. But notice what he says in verse number 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter person. Look at that there. Because in times past he was. 
During the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, God was a respect of persons. During the early part of Acts, when Peter goes to the nation of Israel, first, God's a respect of persons. But there's a new program on the scene called the Dispensation of the Grace of God. And Acts is a transition book. It's taking you from the prophetic program to the mystery program. So there's some things that Paul's going to begin to do that talk about the same scriptures that were prophesied But instead of his early epistles, instead of preaching them in light of prophecy, he's going to preach them in light of the mystery program. And it's going to talk about the judicial judgment that comes upon the nation of Israel so God can conclude them in unbelief so you and I can be saved today. And it's the wisdom of God being revealed in the mystery program. The Bible's something else, y'all. I thank God for his grace. You and I as a bunch of idol-worshiping Gentiles should have been under the judgment of God, and, and matter of fact, we wouldn't even be here today right. because right. the kingdom age would come in. Right. Aren't you glad that God had you and I in mind? Amen. Are you really glad Amen. that he, 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 he had a, a program of his wisdom that was his eternal purpose to put us in Christ and make us part of his heavenly creation? Amen. That's something. It is. But nobody knew that to Paul. Right. Now, Acts chapter 10, here comes Cornelius. Verse 44. I didn't read the rest of the verse. Verse 35. But in every nation that feareth him and does what? That's the issue in Matthew 25 of Peter recognizing the Gentile nations blessing Israel and being saved. You see, it's every nation that worketh righteousness. But today the message is to him that worketh not. But believe on him to justify the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. So those Gentiles will bless Israel during that 70th week. He understood that. Verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them. That's the Gentiles, which heard the word. And they which are of the circumcision said, praise God. The Gentiles are being saved. (laughs) I like to see if you're reading. I know you know the verses, but I like to see if you're reading. It says, they of the circumcision were astonished. Why are they astonished? Well, the verse says, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why? How did he know that? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answer Peter. Now he's going to baptize them, right? Chapter 11, Peter goes to the circumcision, brother. Verse number two. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they of the, that were the circumcision, they praised God that the Gentiles were being saved. That's kind of weird, isn't it, today? It said they contended with them. They were upset. Why are you going to these Gentiles? And Peter rehearses the matter, and he says, well, when the Holy Ghost came upon them, and I heard them speak with tongues, who was I to withstand God? Well, who are we to withstand God? See, Peter started to understand. He, he didn't understand to Paul, but some things are changing here. Now, let me get into my lesson, Acts chapter 13. Because now Paul is saved. I got to get into my lesson. There's something special going on here. And I don't want you to miss it. This is a doctrine on a dispensational issue. But it has to do with the blinding of the nation of Israel. And when God's wrath was at the time when, when the nations and Israel had joined together, Psalms 2, to, to rebel against God, and when sin had risen to its highest height, the Bible says, where sin abounded. When the wrath of God should have been poured out because men deserved it. When sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And so today, grace reigns, folks. And yet, instead of God judging Saul of Tarsus and all those Gentiles, he saved the chief of sinners, made him an ambassador and an apostle, and sent him as a pattern to us to talk about this new dispensation. So what you see Paul doing is going to the Jews in unbelief and concluding in unbelief. And that starts with the blinding of a Jew. Now, for time's sake, I'll do this. There are cycles of judgment under the law program. In Deuteronomy 28 to 2032 and Leviticus 26. And one of the cycles of judgment is that when Israel was rebelling against God and they didn't respond to his discipline, uh, Brother Chestnut talked about that, then God would send foreign nations to chastise them. And he talks about them being in a land where he spoke foreign tongues. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Talking about tongues. Uh, Matthew chapter, Acts chapter 13. 
Now, as Paul and uh, Silas, in verse number one, Paul and Barnabas, I'm sorry, verse number six, just for time's sake, and when they had come through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus, which was of the, uh, which, which was the deputy with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus. I got to put this up here because I got these reading glasses and I can't see. A certain sorcerer. Now notice this: this is the Jew, a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus. Instead of Israel going as the people of God to the Gentile nations, they're opposing what God is doing. Verse number seven which was what the deputy of the country Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and declared to hear the word of God. Now, Paul's name changes here for a reason. Verse 8, but Elimaeus, the sorcerer, for so was his name by interpretation, withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Now, he should have been turning the Gentiles to the faith, but he's opposing what God is doing. He's a sorcerer. Satan's behind him. And then what he says, then says Saul, who also is called Paul, verse 9, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of subtlety and all mischief. Now, let me say this to you. This man, Sir, uh, uh, Bar Jesus, is a type. His name is Jehovah Savior. He's a type of the nation of Israel at this time. First Thessalonians chapter 2. And so Israel as a nation should have been the ones going to the, the Gentiles with the gospel of the kingdom. But instead of doing that, their adversary, their instruments of the devil. Verse number 9. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thy enemy of all righteousness, will now not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And that's the doctrinal demonstration of Romans chapter 11. Where Paul says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Talking about Israel. God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is sent to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. So part of the Gentiles having the sign gifts was for Israel to know that God was going to the Gentiles. That was part of it. But when God sets aside the nation of Israel at the end of Acts all those sign gifts cease, including tongues. Now, I'm saying that because we've got 18 minutes up here. And I got some things I want to bring out in the lesson. It's going, the clock's going to speed, so I'm just sharing you what, where we're going. So that's what Paul says. He says, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Lest you be wise in your own conceit that a blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. God's not through with Israel, because verse 26 says, and so all Israel shall be saved. But the program of grace today has to do with the judicial blindness starting in Acts with the nation of Israel. Now, what is that judicial blindness? In 2 Corinthians, 2 Chronicles 36, when Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian captivity of the Jews, Zedekiah, a king, is blinded. And the Lord in Luke chapter 21 says that the times of the Gentiles have to be fulfilled. When, when Zedekiah was blinded, it was the blinding of a Jew. And Israel, was, they lost their political authority from God among the nations. They became the tail, not the head. But when Paul talks about Bar-Jesus, then Israel loses their spiritual authority. You get that? So by the blinding of those two Jews, God takes the spiritual authority away from the nation and gives it to the Gentiles. And let me say it a little differently. He, he gives it to all men without distinction because there's no difference between a Jew and a Gentile. There's no Jew today. And I think I heard Pastor Jordan or somebody talk about it, and maybe these folks on TV, this is not a Christian nation. You know, God is not favoring America. We're among the nations. We're all concluded in unbelief. When he gave it to Gentile nations, he called out Abram, and he called out, he made a nation out of Abraham. By the way, over in Numbers 11, 25, when Moses, when it says they begin to prophesy and they begin, to, they, begin they, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they begin to prophesy and would not cease, I talked about them producing the canon of scriptures. So one of the things of tongues, and we'll see it, was the production of New Testament scriptures. They were writing the word of God at that time. Now, jumping ahead, you and I have a completed Bible. Everybody's turning to the pages. Today, you wouldn't need somebody to speak to you in tongues. Mm 
I would say turn to Romans chapter 11. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Because God has written us a book that's a completed Bible, and we're going to see when we get back to 1 Corinthians 13, when Paul got the full knowledge of the mystery, the completed revelation of what God had for the dispensation of grace, all those sign gifts cease. There was no need for them anymore. So for somebody to come along to you and say, I have a word of prophecy, you're going to get married next week. <laughs> they do that. They do. That's right. Or a whole bunch of people speaking in tongues. You know, it's fascinating over there where 1 Corinthians 14 where Paul says, now I didn't say this, ladies, it's, it's in the scriptures, let your women learn in silence. You know, he's, talking about, he's talking about spiritual authority because it's over there in 1 Timothy chapter 2, too, where he's talking about the office of a bishop or the leadership in a local church. So it's fascinating. When you see this stuff done today, it's, it's not only the people bringing in the interpreter from, for the Russian evangelist, the missionary. It's not only somebody sitting at the kitchen table trying to make this guy speak in tongues. It's a whole bunch of women doing it. No, I, I, I don't, don't throw stones. <laughs> Paul was for women. So am I. I got the boss over there, so <laughs> she'll, she'll scold me. See, yours telling you about eating sweets. They're telling me about what I said about my wife when she's not there, so we both get in trouble. <laughs> so I'm smart enough, I just don't say anything anymore. <laughs> uh, look at her first, okay? <laughs> now come with me to 1 Corinthians 14. With the production of the canon of scriptures, folks, there was no need anymore for these spiritual gifts. They, they were help gifts in the local church in the first century. And all the epistles that Paul wrote in the first century, Thessalonians, Corinthians, Romans, Galatians, Romans, they all had those sign gifts, the spiritual gifts. But when you get to Paul's latter epistles after Acts, his prison epistles, you don't read about that anymore. Now, you would think when he's instructing a pastor in 1 Timothy chapter 3 or Titus chapter 1, he would tell the bishops how to run the order of the church. You would think that, wouldn't you? But he doesn't. He says, all scriptures give my inspiration to God. And scriptures are profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God might be perfect. So we always say, what say the scriptures? We're the first group in human history to have a completed Bible. You got your own copy. The word of God is not bound. Isn't that wonderful? We always talk about that, and that's the joy of knowing that I have in my hands and possess the written word of the eternal God. And I can get in, and as Brother Morris talked about, I can study it for myself, and I can be accountable for studying myself. Don't believe anything I say. Right. Believe this book. That's right. And I, I told my mother that, and then she came up after that class and said, she told my wife, Russell doesn't know everything. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, what did she say? She said, I don't agree with Russell about everything, but I'm saying, Ma, I'm showing you the scripture. Study that. Don't argue with me. I agree with this book. I didn't write it. The prophecy came not in old times by the will of men. The holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That book wasn't written by men. It was written by God himself. Amen. Isn't that something? Amen. God Almighty didn't leave that to men. You know what men would have done with it. Right. Right. All right. You know the heart of men. Mm. The heart is deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Yeah. It's still that way. Yeah. Thank God for his grace. Amen. Aren't you glad that Grace still abounds. Amen. Aren't you glad that grace reigns today? Amen. I am. Amen. Okay. I guess I don't have but one amen up here. <laughs> I'm not looking for amens. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 19. Paul says, by the way, he's our apostle, right? We're to follow him. Verse number 18. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I thank God to baptize none of you all. This is a good one here, Brother Chestnut. I thank God to speak with more tongues more than you all. We're grace believers, right? Okay, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> Verse number 20 says, Brother, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be ye men. Now watch this. In the law it is written, With the men of other tongues and other lips will I speak to this people. And yet for all this they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophecy serve, serveth not for them that believeth not, but for them that believe. That verse is a quotation from Isaiah. 
chapter 28, when the Gentile nations are coming to Syria and then Babylon comes and takes the ten tribes and then the two northern tribes, two southern tribes into captivity. And part of the judgment, what Isaiah is saying, as I said earlier, part of the cycles of the judgment of God is that they were going to be carried into all the nations and men would speak to them in other languages that wasn't their language. It was a judicial judgment. That's why Zedekiah, he was a blind, he, the, a Jew was blinded. The blinding of a Jew, the political issues of the times of the Gentiles began. Now we're in the, the spiritual times of the Gentiles. Because over there in Acts 13, there's another blinding of a Jew. When Paul uses that quotation, he's preaching prophecy in light of the revelation of the mystery. He's saying this is what happened in times past with Israel, and there was a judicial blindness. But don't forget the doctrine in Romans 11. There's a spiritual blindness there upon Israel. And he applies that according to the revelation of the mystery. Now, I got nine minutes, so go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Sign gets or deceased. And, you know, the, 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 the title of my lesson, Should a Believer Speak in Tongues, and I, I, met, I read that wrong. I thought it said, should believers speak in tongues? So I guess some of you all might believe that you're supposed to speak in tongues. Hopefully when we get through this passage, you won't. Because Paul knew when he was writing to the Corinthian saints, remember he said, we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, the hidden wisdom that God ordained before the world and to our glory, which none of the princes of the world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He said, but I couldn't feed you with meat. I can only feed you with milk. So the Corinthian saints weren't ready to receive some of this, and they were foolish, and they were using the sign gifts in an inappropriate way. So he tells them in 1 Corinthians 13 that these sign gifts are going to cease. Verse number 8, Charity is never failing, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. He's talking about the gift of prophecy. Whether there be tongues, he's talking about the gifts of tongues, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the spiritual gifts, they shall cease. Whether it be knowledge, the gift of knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. During this time, Paul talks about over and over again, he's going to come to visions and revelations of the Lord. He says, the Lord appeared for me to, for the things that he appeared to me and the things he will appear to me. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, the signs of apostle were wrought by me. He had to have the sign gifts to authenticate his apostleship. And you all know the things about healing. You know the things about uh, his ministry at the end where he's beseeching the Lord. Brother Tom talked about that twice, thrice for his infirmities. Couldn't heal anymore. Couldn't send a handkerchief. Paul couldn't raise the dead anymore. There was a transition that happened that now God brought in the full revelation of the mystery and the grace program. So Paul has some new knowledge. And he says... By the way, you see that word, verse 9, for we know in part? That's the word gnosis. If you jump down to verse number 12, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then shall, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as I'm known. That's the word epigonosis. He changed the word. So Paul had gnosis as he's getting revelation. But when he talks about the full uh, assurance of understanding, in his latter epistles, he has epigenosis. He knows exactly the full understanding of who God has made us in Christ. The full revelation of the mystery is completed. That makes sense to you all? But now he had partial knowledge. Verse number 10. But when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be what? When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man... I put away childish things. So he talks about seeing through a glass darkly. The glass, the glass in the Bible, James talks about the word of God being like a glass or a mirror. You're able to see a reflection. Now I can go and see, as a brother and have talked about all week, my full, complete standing in Jesus Christ. To know that I'm accepted in the beloved. To know that I'm complete in him. To understand I've been seated together in the heavenly places in Christ. To understand that one day in the ages to come, he's going to show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us to Jesus Christ. I have an eternal purpose, a part of an eternal destiny because we're in Christ. And you do too. We share in his glory one day and right now. So we don't want to be children in spiritual things, tossed to and fro 
and cared about with every wind of doctrine. The word of God is designed to give you stability as you study it and rightly divide it. That's what he said in Romans 16, 25. Now to him is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Five minutes. Come with me to Ephesians 4. So today, the issue is to take the program, the epistles of Paul, that has the design for godly edification. It's to, it's to take the word of God for me being a babe and develop me to a full, mature son to un who understands the will of God and is able to go out and do it. Not to be under a law program where I need tutors and governors. Nobody needs to come along and tell you what to do today. That verse says over there, not that we should have dominion over your faith, but be helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand. But you got to get in this book and let this book get in you. And then God, the Holy Spirit, has been said several times, we're working you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Amen. Then it's up to me to have the right heart attitude. Somebody told me that the other day. I think it was Brother Johnson. You know, are you doing it grudgingly? Are you doing it in necessity? Or are you doing it from your heart? Exuko. Out of your heart, for God loves a cheerful giver. Is the motivation today grace? Or is it the law? Or are you being conformed to this world? You know they're trying to still do that to us. Or are you being strong in the Lord and the power of his might? Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 11, and he gave some. Now, this is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, verse number 8, 9, and 10. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints. That's the issue of maturity. I often tell people, you know, part of our ministry is to grow people to a point of maturity. That's the goal of the local church. That's the goal of this conference that we all, all grow to perfection so we can be involved in the Father's business. The perfected saints do the work in the ministry. You know, I grew up in a religious uh, environment where everything was on the pastor. He was always supposed to do everything. So if somebody gets sick, my wife used to say to me, aren't you going to visit? I would say, I'm going to visit him, but some other folks go visit him. Or if somebody needs to hear the gospel, you shouldn't have to call me up. I love this brother. We gotta, I'm, I'm going to buy him lunch later on. <laughs> well, I'm not right. This book is right. But thank you. But I don't know where you're at in your spiritual life. But the goal, God's will for us is to grow up into maturity, into a full-grown son or daughter, to adult status, of who we really are in Christ, and function that. Folks, that's in your home. That's in your community. That's around your family. That's where his ambassadors we're supposed to be busy about the king's business. He says, for the work of the ministry, watch this, for the building up of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God. That's that word epigenosis again. Until a perfect man, until the measure of the stature and the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children. There are babes in Christ still around us who've been saved for years. They told me to preach for a verdict. If you've been saved for a long time, where are you at in your spiritual development? None of this makes sense to me to come and give you a bunch of scriptures and not see you be motivated or me motivated to do the work of God when we leave here. That doesn't make sense. Come here and hear a bunch of preachers with a bunch of scriptures, and yet the word of God doesn't convict us and motivate us to get busy about for him. You know, that issue when Paul talked about, the, he talks about now by the faith, hope, and love. The issue there is a mental attitude, love. You know that. It's an agape love. It's a, a mindset that values who he is, the Lord Jesus, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's why Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Well, how did Christ live in him? Through the doctrine. Through the word of God as it was built up in his inner man life. And as, as it was built up in his inner man life, it began to produce his life. Not my life. My life's still a mess. I don't know about you all. Russell shows up at times. I don't like that guy. I don't. I'm okay with him, but I don't like him all. He can, yeah. 
You know, he doesn't remember, but years ago, I asked him about some things about my personality. He said, well, you're just mean. <laughs> now, I didn't believe him, but, you know, the Bible says by the mouths of two or three witnesses. <laughs> oh, y'all, didn't, you didn't hear the end. I got 49 seconds. Every word is established. So my wife will say sometimes, you're just mean. So that's the establishing the word. So I got to <laughs> submit myself unto God, okay? There would be no more children carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man. Notice that these religious church operators and sometimes saints and their cunning craftiness, craftiness whereby they lie in wait to do what? Deceive you. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things, even here, uh, in here with even Christ, from which the whole body is fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplier. To the edifying of the working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of self and love. He's talking about the doctrine folks being put in us. As the edification structure is built up in your inner man. That's why Paul talks about godly edification, which is in faith, so do. And that's why the goal of the ministry is to perfect saints. The things that thou hast heard of me among the many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. What are they going to be able to do? Teach others also. I look out here and I'm through. But I see an audience of people that have a lot of gray hair like I do. Thank God for these young people. You know, the generations down the line are the ones that are going to carry this message on. We're dying off the scene. So that's part of the maturity. You've got children. You've got grandchildren. You've got great-grandchildren. The children got children. you got teenagers. That's our future. Without you being mature, you don't have anything that you're able to offer them in terms of him. Tongues have ceased, folks. And if you're still talking in tongues today, you know, just continue to read the scriptures. Talk to somebody. I'll stop this thing, right? Okay. Talk to somebody who knows about the issue of doctrinal and dispensational truth. If you don't rightly divide the word of truth and rightly divide Paul's early epistles from his latter epistles, there are some things that you still will be doing that's out of the will of God for us today. Father, thank you. We give you honor and glory in Christ's name we pray. Amen.